Does anyone else remember Little Witch and Jack o' Lantern? It's kind of an obscure show. Most of the people I've mentioned it to have never heard of it and I can't find a shred of information about it online, but I know that it existed. I remember it so vividly. For the uninitiated, which I assume to be most of you, the show aired sometimes in the mid-80s. It must have been sometime around 1987. I'd compare it to stuff like Polka.Door, The Big Comfy Couch or Pee Wee's Playhouse, although this show had a distinct Halloween aesthetic to it. Despite that, it didn't just play around Halloween. Episodes aired all throughout the year on one of the local channels in my hometown. The main character was this young witch named Melanie. She was about seven or eight and was always dressed in a purple and golden dress with striped stockings and a typical witch's hat. She was the only character in the show who was completely played in live action. I think they switched out her actress once or twice during the run of the series because I remember a couple of different faces playing the role but the outfit was always the same and the little witch was always named Melanie. It's been so long though that I don't entirely remember. Anyways, Melanie lived in the castle of the great jack-o'-lantern the most powerful wizard in the world, and, naturally, he had a jack-o'-lantern for a hat. I'm sure that part was explained in the show, but I don't remember what the explanation was. I think he accidentally cursed himself or something like that. Jack was played by a guy in a big red robe that trailed behind him. The pumpkin that made up his head was animated so that a grinning face carved into it would move and emote as he spoke. The animation wasn't great, but it did a job well enough for a kid's show. Jack had this deep, booming voice that echoed like thunder and I remember that it used to scare the hell out of me when I was a little kid. I both loved and feared Jack. Whenever he came on screen, he absolutely stole the show. And it's the part with him that I remember the most. As an adult, I'd probably recognize it as a Vincent Price impersonation, but as a kid, I didn't know any better. The rest of the characters didn't stand out as much, and I have to admit that they kind of blurred together in my mind. I know that there was a talking skull on the wall named Harry Bones, and a bat would fly in from time to time, usually to sing a song. Melanie had a black cat that was played by a puppet, but I can't remember anything about it. And one of the bookshelves talked. I didn't remember the name of the bookshelf, but I remember that the running gag with him was that he was allergic to dust and he'd always sneeze. Now, when this bookshelf sneezed, it was an event. The books went flying off of him, usually in hitting poor Melanie. And she'd have to clean them up while the bookshelf just sat there and said in his deep, sad voice, Sorry, Melanie. Anyways, the series didn't have much of an overarching plot. The basic setup was that Melanie lived in Jack's castle so that she could grow up to be a great spellcaster just like him. She always wanted to try new, more powerful spells, and she was confident that she could master them quickly and impress Jack. Most of the time, she'd screw it up and Jack had to come in and fix it. All he had to do was wave his magic wand and everything was back to normal. Then, he would sit Melanie down and they get to my favorite part of the show. The dialogue wasn't always the same, I don't think. But I remember it when something like this. A fine effort you've made, little witch. But remember that there's magic in the world in places you'd never suspect. Then he would take a book off the bookshelf and sit down in his armchair. He'd open it and the inside of the book would be another screen that would play a clip. The clip would always be different from episode to episode and tied in to whatever spell Melanie had tried to cast. The one I remember most was from the episode where Melanie tried to conjure a banquet from nothing and the clip talked about how farmers raise animals for the food we eat. They showed a little bit on the production of eggs, milk, and even showed some kids about Melanie's age petting barnyard animals. 
There was another episode where Melanie had tried to use a spell to stop the rain so she could go outside and play. She'd caused a flood instead. It was all about the water cycle and how important it was. The clips were all like that, focusing on the mundane science that made our world work the way it did. At the end of the clip, Jack O'Lantern would close his book. He'd look right at the audience, his glowing pumpkin mouth grinning wide across his face, and he'd say, Always remember, there's everyday magic in places you would never expect. Then, he'd laugh that eerie Vincent Price laugh he had, and Melanie would wave goodbye to the camera before the episode ended. I was absolutely crazy about this show when I was five or six. Every evening from Monday to Friday, at 4 to 4.15 p.m., my butt was parked in front of the TV to watch Melanie and Jack's latest adventure. Nowadays, I can only remember bits and pieces of it. I'm sure that if I ever found it again, I'd see things that have escaped my memory completely or find out that I misremembered half of it. There is one thing about Little Witch and Jack O'Lantern I'm quite sure I'll never forget, though. And that would be the bedtime story hotline. It wasn't technically part of the show itself, but every now and then I'd see it advertised during commercial breaks. The commercials always started with a flash of lightning, illuminating the shadow of Jack O'Lantern. His face would light up and he'd lean in close to the camera. Good evening, little witches and wizards. Do you seek to discern the mysteries of the unknown? Do you aspire to attain mastery over mystery? Call Melanie and I at... He'd list off the number that flashed on the screen. And we shall regale you with tales of the unreal and of the everyday magic hiding in the most unlikely of places. There's a new tale every day, along with posters and stickers to adorn your magical lair. The commercial would then cut to Melanie sitting in the library of Jack's castle and she'd say... A portion of the proceeds from your $235 two-minute call will go towards the education of kids like you and me. Then, Jack would rise from behind the chair she sat in, his grinning face glowing the dim light. Ask your parents' permission before you call. We look forward to hearing from you. With that, Jack would let loose his sinister cackle and the number would flash on the screen along with text that I was too young to read. I presume it was just the details of the service for the benefit of the parents. As soon as I started airing those commercials, I absolutely had to call that number. I was just a kid at the time, and as far as I knew, I'd just been handed a chance to talk to the real Jack and the real Melanie. I recall fantasizing about actually visiting Jack's castle and becoming a great and powerful wizard just like him. Maybe... Maybe I could even be on the show just like Melanie. All I needed to do was call and talk to Jack. My parents were good enough not to dash my hopes, so after a minimal amount of pleading, they let me call the number. I can remember the swell of excitement in my chest when at bedtime, a few nights after I'd first seen the commercial, my dad poked his head into my room and said, Hey there, Logan. Would you like to give Jack and Melanie a call before you hit the sack, kiddo? In my elation, I don't remember exactly what I said in response, but I'm sure the condensed version of it would be yes. I watched as my dad dialed the number that I already knew off by heart, and when he handed me the phone, I couldn't physically hold in my excitement. I remembered barely being able to hold still as I said, Hi Jack, hi, hi, hi. Hello there, young spellcaster, Jack's voice replied. It was probably just a recording, but I was too young to know that, and too young to care. Hi, Jack! I'm so glad you've called to talk with Melanie and I this evening. Hello! Melanie's voice chimed in. We've had quite a productive day, Jack continued. I think you'd be impressed with just how far Melanie has come with her magical skills. I found the perfect spell to clean the dust out of that old library so that Mr. Bookcase's allergies wouldn't be so bad. He was so grateful. Then Jack showed me how to prepare a great banquet using only magic. And a splendid banquet it was. You truly are a prodigy in the making, little witch. But remember not to lose your appreciation for the everyday magic all around us. Although, after such a big dinner... I'm a little bit tired. The hour has grown quite late. I'm sure our friend is wary as well. 
Let us all retire for the evening. Please do call us again tomorrow. Your company is always welcomed in my castle, fellow spellcaster. Pleasant dreams. The short message ended, but my excitement didn't go down at all. I was still ready to bounce off the walls. Even if I hadn't been able to say a word, Jack had still called me a fellow spellcaster, and that was without a doubt the crowning achievement I'd gotten in my five years of life. As pumped up as I was, I was eager to hit a sack just so I could call them again tomorrow. Maybe I'd get to tell them about my day that time. Maybe they'd even invite me to go to the castle. None of that was ever actually going to ever pan out, but... But I was still at the age where I could believe it would, and that was almost as good as it actually happening. The next night my parents let me call Jack and Melanie again. It went about the same as it had the night before. The story was different this time, as Melanie talked about how she'd been working on a spell that could change the weather, and had instead caused a hurricane inside of Jack's library. Even the greatest spellcasters make a mistake from time to time. Growth comes from practice, little witch, Jack had said. Just remember not to lose your appreciation for the everyday magic all around us. Of course not, Jack. Although after such a busy day, I'm a little bit tired. The hour has grown quite late. I'm sure our friend is weary as well. Let us all retire for the evening. Please do call us tomorrow. Your company is always welcomed in my castle, fellow spellcaster. Pleasant dreams. Hearing the same closing line a second time was no less exciting than it had been the night before. And, before I went to bed, I begged my parents to let me call again. They told me that I could so long as I stayed on my best behavior, and that was a promise I was determined to uphold. Calling Jack and Melanie became part of my routine. Every night the calls would be more or less the same, only with a different story. Every night my parents would dial the number, bring me to my phone and leave me to my own devices as I listened to the message. I don't think the story is ever repeated either, or if they did, I never noticed it. I was too blinded by my excitement to talk to the real Jack and Melanie. Then, things changed. My mom had come into my room holding the phone as she finished dialing the number. Have a nice chat, she said with a knowing smile as I sat in bed and waited for the sound of Jack's voice. Hello there, young spellcaster, Jack said. The same intro he always had. Hi, Jack, I replied. I'm so glad you've called to talk to Melanie and I this evening. Usually Melanie's voice would chime in with a hello. However, this time she was silent. Unfortunately, our little witch has had to retire quite early today. I suppose it's for the best. Working with children can be ever so trying. I don't suppose you'd know much about that, would you? Regardless, one can only handle so much disaster before it inevitably becomes frustrating. After her latest catastrophe, I decided it would be best to carve up her face just like mine. Such a procedure requires a long, sometimes eternal slumber afterwards. And so our little witch has been sent to this rest. But not to worry, I shall find another. The hour has grown quite late. I'm sure that you are quite weary, as am I. Let us both retire for the evening. Please do call me again tomorrow. Your company is always welcomed in my castle, fellow spellcaster. Pleasant dreams. The line went dead, and I sat by the phone, silent and unsure of what to make of what I just heard. Jack had never once hurt Melanie in the show. He had always been a kind and understanding teacher. More than that, he was her friend. He wanted to help Melanie, not hurt her. I wondered if perhaps Melanie had done something bad. My parents never quite subscribed to the belief that a smack upside the head was the best way to raise a child. But I had friends in school whose parents were a little more old-fashioned. I knew that some kids got spanked or slapped if they were being bad. I'd never imagined that Jack would treat Melanie that way. When my mom came to take the phone, I didn't say anything to her. 
I just gave it up and let myself be tucked in. The fact that I was quieter than usual didn't sleep by her. What's wrong, sweetheart? Didn't you like the story? I didn't, I said. Jack isn't mean, is he? He wouldn't hurt Melanie, right? My mom went quiet. No, she finally said. No, of course not. Jack is a good wizard, he doesn't hurt people. What happened in the story? He was really mad at Melanie and he said she had to go to bed early. That was about as much as I'd been able to understand from what Jack had said. What exactly he'd meant when he'd said he'd carved Melanie's face up had gone over my head. I'm sure that if my mom had known about that part, she wouldn't have taken what I've said so well. The subtle relief on her face set my own troubled mind at ease. If she didn't see anything wrong, then what did I have to worry about? Well, Jack is kinda like Melanie's dad, isn't he? She asked. When people misbehave, we have to show them that what they did was wrong. If an adult does a bad thing, then there are things that can happen to them to try to make sure they don't do those things again. It's the same with children. Like being sent to your room? Exactly. Nobody likes it, but if you do something bad, then someone will have to punish you for it, no matter how old you are. It's called accountability. And I guess that's a kind of everyday magic too. None of that actually made complete sense to me at the time, but I guess it was enough to shut me up for the night. Mom tucked me in and let me go to bed. By morning, I'd almost forgotten all about Jack's strange story, and when bedtime came around again, I was just as excited as usual to call Jack again. After I was tucked into bed, my dad dialed the number and brought me the phone. I took it with the same eagerness I always did, although when I heard Jack's voice on the line, I distinctly remember an involuntary shiver down my spine. Hello there, young spellcaster. Jack's tone was harsher than usual. His voice had more of a hiss to it than it had before. It caught me off guard and I didn't reply with my usual greeting. Jack continued anyways. I'm so glad you've called to talk with Melanie and I this evening. Hello. It was good to hear Melanie's voice back, but there was something off about it. I'm sure that it was the same actress as before, but her voice was warped and hard to make out. Her tone was different as well. Instead of the cheaper, upbeat voice you'd always had, instead, she was much quieter. Her single line of dialogue came out as more of a squeak than anything else. We've had such an interesting day today, Jack said. Today we had a visitor in the castle, a wonderful young man who made up in charm for what he lacked in magic. He came upon my castle unannounced, and his arrival was quite timely. This charming man provided me the key ingredient in a special potion I am brewing. It is a magical stew built off of the everyday magic of nostalgia. Do you know what nostalgia is, my friend? A memory. Melanie said, her voice still quiet and distorted. In a sense, yes, but also far more than that. I wanted to remind Melanie of my previous apprentice, and so, for supper, I prepared this potion for us to share. This charming man was kind enough to provide us the meat for my stew. Cooking itself is another kind of everyday magic. With the addition of heat, things can change. Hard roots become soft, flavors blend together, flesh separates from the bone, and grows tender and juicy. I could almost hear Jack salivating on the other end of the phone line and it left me with a deep feeling of discomfort. I wanted to hang up the phone, but I didn't dare. What would Jack say or do if I did? It's a shame that the man had to give up so much for us, but we have gained so much from his sacrifice. Least of all, a meal. Did you enjoy it, little witch? Melanie did not respond for a moment, but I could hear a whimper over the phone line. Perhaps not, then. Some meats are um, an acquired taste. 
Regardless of your taste, my friend, remember not to lose your appreciation for the everyday magic all around us. Now the hour has grown quite late, we are weary. The charming man slumbers eternally beneath the castle, and it is time for us all to retire for the evening. Please, do call again, fellow spellcaster. I appreciate having a friend with whom I can talk to. Pleasant dreams. The line went dead, leaving me with a sense of unease deep in my gut that I didn't know how to explain. Looking back, I am grateful that I was too young to truly comprehend the vile things that Jack had described. I didn't understand the things hidden behind the crooning words. All I knew was that something was not right. I didn't sleep as soundly that night. I don't think anyone could have. The following night, I found myself dreading my call with Jack. It had become so ingrained into my routine that I didn't dare say no when my dad brought me the phone before bed. Have a nice call, kiddo, he said with a smile. I didn't reply and just quietly took the phone from him, dreading the inevitable sound of Jack's voice. Hello there, young spellcaster, Jack crooned. His voice sounded even worse than it had the night before. The Vincent Price impersonation seemed half-assed and Jack didn't sound like himself, although his voice was no less chilling to listen to. Even now I can still hear it in the back of my mind. Uh, hi, Jack, I said quietly. I'm so glad you've called to chat with Melanie and I this evening. Hello. Like the night before, Melanie's voice was a garbled squeak. She sounded as if she was on the verge of tears. What a wonderful day we've had. Jack said. My nostalgic potion has reminded our little witch of her duties in my castle, lest she join her predecessor and that oh-so-charming man in their wakeless slumber down in our dungeon. When left to simmer, his flesh took on such wonderful flavors. I should not indulge so often, but I must confess the temptation is difficult to resist especially when there is meat so readily available. I listened in silence, tears filling my eyes as I listened to Jack speak. Shall I tell you about Melanie's predecessor? Charming little thing, yet unwilling to take direction. Of course, when you put a calf into the stew, the cow and the bull must go too. Family belongs together, after all but their mixed flavors offered such a heavenly aroma that I've as of yet failed to recapture. Perhaps one day you shall help me with that, my friend. No, I croaked. I, I don't want to. Now, now, Logan. Don't you want to see the mysteries of the unknown for yourself? The phone fell from my hand and I kicked it off my bed and across the room. A scream escaped me as I started to cry. I hadn't expected a response from Jack. He'd never responded to me before. He'd never even said my name before, but I knew what I heard. I could hear his hissing, snarling voice over the phone still, but I couldn't hear his words. Whatever he was saying was drowned by the sound of my dad bursting into my room to see what was the matter. I ran to him, hugging his leg and begging him to not let Jack turn me into stew. I remember the look of shock on his face before he spotted a cordless phone on the ground. He picked it up and stared at it. I don't know if he heard anything, but his furrowed brow said enough. He made my mom sit with me while he called the police and she did whatever she could to calm me down. I ended up having to sleep in my parents' bed that night and the nightmares of Jack looming over me haunted me for weeks afterwards. I remember that a police officer came to our house to ask me about the things that Jack had said during the phone calls. I'd told him everything I could think of, although I'm sure there were parts I left out either because I didn't understand them enough or because I simply didn't remember. Needless to say, I never called that phone number again. My parents and I didn't discuss Little Witch and Jack o' Lantern after that night. I refused to watch the show and it wasn't until a few months later that I noticed it was entirely gone from the channel. Something else had taken its time slot. I didn't bother asking about it. I was happy to let that show fade into a distant memory and never think about it again. 
But I suppose Jack gave me a fair warning about nostalgia. Thoughts of the witch and jack-o'-lantern have crept into my mind from time to time over the years. The show doesn't have much of a legacy online. There's almost nothing on IMDb or any other site I've gone through. The most I've managed to find is mention of an actress by the name of Judy Kirk who supposedly played Melanie. I didn't find anything else on her beside the name and trust me, I've looked. I had a little bit more luck going through all the newspapers. I still live in the same town and, one long weekend, I was with my own kids at the library and I thought to ask the librarian about historic newspapers. Sure enough, they had some on microfilm and they let me look through it. The newspapers don't offer much. There's only a passing mention of Little Witch and Jack O' Lantern from 1989. I found it in an article about human remains discovered beneath an old warehouse just outside of town. It had once been owned by a man by the name of Timothy Clay. Clay had built a set of the show in that warehouse and filmed everything there with a small crew. He had been the voice and the mind behind Jack O' Lantern before he'd been arrested for assault. Apparently, not long afterwards, they'd found approximately eight bodies buried beneath that warehouse. One believed to belong to a young man who'd gone missing two years prior. Three belonging to one family who had formerly been associated with the production prior. And four belonging to another family. Looking into Clay himself, I found that he'd passed away in December of 1987. The article I read didn't state how. But, as far as I knew, the man was on parole at the time, not in custody. To state my curiosity, I also looked into Judy Kirk, mostly because I wanted to know if hers had been amongst the bodies recovered. As far as I can tell, she wasn't. There was no mention of Judy Kirk at all. If she'd ever existed, she'd drop right off the face of the earth entirely, it seemed. Perhaps that was for the best. If she was the one who'd played Melanie at the end, then maybe she deserved her privacy. I don't need to read the gruesome details of these crimes to know that Timothy Clay was a monster. I suspect he told me everything I needed to know himself back in 1987. I still have a lot of unanswered questions about Little Witch and Jack O'Lantern, but I'd say I've dug deep enough that I can say I'm satisfied. This is the best place to leave the mystery to rest. If I go any deeper, I don't know what I'll find. Truthfully, I don't think I want to know. I still remember the phone number, though. I still remember the growl in Jack's voice when he spoke to me all those years ago. I'm not sure what came over me. My wife and kids were out the other day. I had nothing else to do and old memories of Jack and Melanie crossed my mind, like they had a thousand times before. I thought about the commercial for that hotline. I still remember the phone number. I'd known it off by heart, after all. I picked up my cell phone and figured I'd really had nothing to lose. I expected either a deadline, but the phone still rang when I dialed the number. That shouldn't have been surprising. The number had probably been assigned to someone else in the 33 years since I last called it. Whoever would answer would be part of a company I'd probably never heard of before. I'd hang up and have my closure. Someone on the other end picked up the phone and I listened as a woman's voice on the other end said a word that sent a chill down my spine. Hello there, young spellcaster. I was silent. The voice was not one I'd heard before. And yet there was something familiar about it. There was something off about the way she spoke. Like a lisp, but more subtle. Uh, hello? I asked with a trembling voice. Jack? I'm afraid Jack no longer owns this castle. But it's alright, I'm here. There was a tranquility to that woman's voice that set me on edge. A distracted calmness that seemed out of place. Would you like to hear a story about what happened to Jack, Logan? The woman asked and I felt a color draining from my face. On reflex I cast the phone away from me and heard it clatter to the ground as I retreated away from it like I was still just a scared child. From across the room I could hear a low chuckle on the other end of the line. Another time then, the woman's voice said. Pleasant dreams, fellow spellcaster.
pleasant dreams. The line when dead, I won't be calling back. <laughs>